Bojo. Welcome to Watts Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I am Bronwyn Slade. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You listed on the radio at 91.9 FM or, and also on the television at Bell Express U Channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from three till four in the afternoon. And we are in our eighth week of our nine week course. This is the, right at the end. So at this point, you definitely should have, have submitted some mark, some work for marking. Um, June 10th, next Friday is the last day that you are eligible to submit work. If you don't, then you will have to resubmit all of the work for the course and re-register either, um, either in the summer, though the, I'm not sure who's marking in the summer. I am not, so I'm not sure exactly how that works this summer, um, but I will be back in February is the plan. Sorry, February in the fall so that you can do it then. But basically get your work in for June 10th. Remember the key questions are listed at the end of each of your IELTS lessons. all of them, check your understanding, your the activities and the review questions that are listed at the end of each IELTS lesson. Please show all of your work and your steps and your thinking. Give me full sentences to really explain what it is that you're talking about. And make sure you are actually answering the question that is being asked. You are able to do this by hand if you want or electronically. If you'd like to write in the workbooks, you can, though the space is pretty small. So make sure you give me fully formed ideas. You can also type them up in a Word or Google Doc. That is fine too. Or just write them on a separate line paper. That's fine. Or blank paper, whatever. If you want to write them out, that's fine. Just make sure it's labeled clearly so I know what it is that you're, which question you're answering. If you are going to do an electronic file, Word and Google Docs are the files that are easiest for me to access. So that would be best if you could send them to me in those. Um, if you're going to do something else, just let me know and we can try to make sure I can open those files. There are three different methods for submitting your work. The first is to scan and send your work electronically. So you can scan your completed work in using a smart device. You can use either the iPhone Notes app or the Android Google Drive app. They both have scan functions that are fairly straightforward. If you prefer not to do that, if that doesn't work for you and you'd like to take pictures, that's fine too. Then you can send it to me either through email at studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca or you can send it to me through Facebook Messenger at bslatewasa. The second method to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout, we have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street and we uh, the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance sorry my brain is a little bit off today it's a bit of an off day for me the third method is to hand your work into your dec your dc can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll-free fax to 1-800-463-7852 if you'd like to connect with me through social media, feel free. Both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can find me there. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and I upload them to YouTube by the end of the week. Uh, they're all found on the playlist SVN3E and shared. I share them on Facebook. Science is really visual. I try to integrate as many diagrams, images, and videos as I can in terms of really being able to get the full experience. So I strongly encourage you to connect with the video. So either by joining me live through Zoom or by watching the replays on YouTube where you can access all the lessons and get the full experience. If you can't do either of those options but would still like access to the videos, let me know and I can send you a copy of them 
um, so you can watch them on your own computer. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa. Call me at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll-free 1-800- 667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. till 4 p.m., though I teach the first hour and the last hour of the day of my day, so that is not a good time to try to reach me. I'll go back to you as soon as I can if I miss you. And final, another reminder that June 10th is the last day to um, submit all of your work, including your culminating activity, which is something that I still need to give to you. So if you are planning on handing in all of your work and getting your completing your course and you just still give you your culminating so it would be you that's worth 30 percent of your mark you need to get it done if you're going to be successful in the course i think it's really important to position myself within the context of this course and our education society as a whole as that frames how i teach and what makes sense to me I have white settler ancestry, I have white privilege, and this means that things have come easier to me in my life than many other folks, particularly within education. Um, I learned and was treated the way that it was expected and therefore I was su succeeded, um, which has set me up for success in life. But I work to disrupt these cycles in terms of making sure that students can see themselves within all of our courses and are feel welcome and aligned with the classes. I don't get it right all the time. I still have lots to figure out, but it is something that I am working on. I do live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, so I work to incorporate these teachings within my course and connecting to this that culture. Um, though of course it's not as simple and straightforward as, as that, as the Anishinaabe people are a very diverse group and one, one idea doesn't fit for all for all individuals. Um, so it's something that is a work in progress that I will continue to learn about. This is my first time teaching this course. So I do have lots to learn as well as unlearning. It has been a process and I continue to recognize the mistakes that I'm making and the things that I can do to improve. If there's any suggestions that you have, please let me know. I'm happy to um, adjust accordingly. Our textbook is very Eurocentric. It uses some problematic language and it ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences, which is really quite problematic and unacceptable. Therefore, I try to integrate these into our lessons and into our conversations as much as I can in order to make it relevant for our, our students. So we are wrapping up unit seven today. Today is our last lesson of new material. Even the conversation of natural resources was using natural resources with sustainable practices. So we've talked before about how we believe we have a right for, to free speech, but that the United Nations and other organizations believe that we should have a right to water and how 1.1 billion people lack access to ad adequate clean water supply and how this is unacceptable in our world today. Either we, our water is threatened by pollution or it is being tapped into and extracted as a, for capitalist profit by big corporations and being sent, sold back to people at ridiculous premiums. Um, so it's something that is really an issue that we need to address. Okay, so today in lesson 23, our last new topic lesson, next week we will be reviewing the full course, um, briefly going over all seven chapters again. Um, but again, it's really brief. It's really quick, a lot to shove in into a week, right? We've done eight weeks to cover all 23 of the lessons. So to do a quick cram study in the last week is, is a lot. Um, but we today we're managing Canada's natural resources. So we talked about the natural resources and how to extract them. And now we're talking about how we manage them. So 
today you will know that you have met by the end of this lesson, you hopefully will be able to identify and describe the challenges in resource management in Canada. So you know you've met the learning goals because you can explain how to monitor and maintain fisheries and forests. You can explain the concerns surrounding mining minerals, the viability and recovery, and you can explain the problems of oil sands. So as Canadians, we benefit from our natural resources, but these benefits come with great responsibility. We have learned that overhunting, overfishing, and overharvesting natural resources can lead to their destruction. When measuring a natural resource's usefulness and managing its extraction, we must consider sustainability. Sustainable practices will allow us to continue to use these resources into the future without using them up or damaging them beyond repair. When we take this approach, the health of a natural resource becomes the focus along with its viability. Viability is its ability to be used in a practical way. So this is really essential to have both the environmental needs met in terms of us not destroying the environment, but also our economic and personal needs of using these resources in practical ways for ourselves. Okay, so let's look at viability of natural resources. So fish, forests, and minerals can only be harvested in a sustainable way if certain conditions are met. People use different methods to make sure fist forest and potential mines are viable for higher harvest. They also monitor the resources as they are being harvested to make sure they continue to be viable. So first, first fish, we're going to look at counting annually. Counting annually on fish scales is one way people can find out about fish stocks. As a fish grows, scale grows, Rings on the scale indicate that growth. So the image in your workbook isn't super awesome, but I was found one that's a little bit clearer. And you can see that these, and you can see there's a bit of a line in the scales that shows that this is how much growth has happened in a year. And it slows down in the winter. So each of these white lines that are horizontal across the rest of the fin are, are showing uh, a full year's growth, then you can see that there are some slight changes um, in idiosyncrasies depending on the health of the fish. We don't are not going in full fledged in terms of what this means, but this uh, just gives us a little bit of idea of what scientists who study this are looking at. Oops, not where I want to be at all. Sorry. I told you, not my day. The annulus or year mark is a special zone of rings that shows where the growth for the year ended in winter time when growth slows. The annuli helps scientists discover the ages of individual fish. This can help them find out more about fish populations and determine whether or not harvesting is sustainable. So they tell us how old the fish are and how therefore we know if it's okay to harvest more or if we need to let the fish grow because the majority is only of a certain age and are not mature. So from examining a newly scientist can find out the rates at which fish grow in certain rivers or lakes and compare them to expected growth rates. They can estimate the age at which fish reach sexual maturity, which helps develop fish laws that make sure enough fish can reproduce at least once before being caught. And they find out if a fish fish population is under stress by humans. Fish stocks that are being overfished tend to lack mature fish. Then looking at forests, when managing forests, people must consider many factors. Three of these are biodiversity and ecosystem health. So forest ecosystems support a great diversity of wildlife species, which we've talked about extensively. These species can negatively be negatively impacted by removing too many trees. So it only goes to show, makes complete connect uh, sense that if we cut down the habitat, then the wildlife that is dependent upon that habitat do not thrive. So then we also need to consider economic viability. A forest located too far from a mill where logs can be cut into lumber may be too expensive to harvest. Forests Stirs may also avoid harvesting small trees or tree species that are not wanted for wood products. 
And then carbon emissions. How foresters harvest trees and renew forests with new planting can affect how much carbon is released into the atmosphere. So all of these things are worth considering, are essential for considering. So foresters gather data about trees before harvesting them. This is, there's definitely a process, an extensive process that foresters go through um, before just going in and cutting trees down. They create succession models and sample the cores of select trees to find out more about forests. In addition, to help them stay on target while managing forests, some forest managers choose to follow certain standards and become cert certified. So we'll talk about all of these things. First, succession models. Succession is the natural replacement of plant or animal species in an area over time. Each stage of succession forms the backdrop for the next stage, so like a building block. After a fire or after a forest has been cut down, certain plant and animal species will move back into the area to begin renewing the forest. Foresters use succession models to predict the value of fibers, the pulp, lumber, and other wood products, and the non-fibers, the wildlife, the recreation, the natural beauty in forests, depending on where the forest is located. So depending on what they're deciding is valuable. Succession models are often complex computer programs that involve a variety of data sets that help scientists calculate and predict ecological renewal. So this isn't easy stuff that you just go and you look and you say, uh, this is what we need to do in order to get this outcome. They're pretty complex models. The models are based on extensive research. They take into account type of disturbance, region, climate, soil type, tree and animal species, and many other factors. So there's many other pieces of information that go together to make decisions about how to treat the forests. So here is a succession model after a forest fire that I took out of your textbook. Um, it shows just a simple uh, covering of how the forest is changing and how the animals are coming back to it. So, in, so it's a forest fire is what happened. And then in the year zero, you can see that there are, um, here all the trees are burned. And then after one to five years, aspen and poplar suckers and shrubs and herbs have grown back. And black bear, deer and ruffled grouse have all started coming back. They are part of the process to start. Um, repopulating and using the forest. Then after 15 years, we have a young stand. So it's taken about 15 years for the trees to grow back. And we still have the same animals plus moose have started to be part of it. Then by 50 years, we have a young mixed wood. And so no longer, so bears are no longer happy in this ecosystem. So they've moved on to another place that is better for them. After 75 years, we have a maturing mixed wood forest. And um, the deer have moved out. That's not a good place for them. They need the smaller spaces to hide probably. And then by, oh, and the red squirrel have moved in at the beginning of the young mixed wood. Then by 150 years, it's a mature white spruce forest. Um, but that's what has thrived. And the moose and the ruffled grouse have moved out and moved on and the red squirrel is continues to thrive. Obviously there are other animals and other plants in this area, but that's just sort of an idea of how it happens. So then we also talked about core sampling as being a way of monitoring forest health. So foresters use a core sample tool called an increment bore to collect evidence about a forest's recent history. They drill the bore into a tree into the desired depth. Then they carefully remove a plug of wood from the bore. This method does not harm the trees. They're just taking a little, like a blood sample almost, except that it's more like a flesh sample, which is not, doesn't sound good, but a blood sample sounds like, okay. So here you can see is the, this is the um, increment bore. So, this you twist in and in, it goes, it drives into the tree, and then you twist it out. And then you can see here, you cut a little bit of wood, and that is coming here, then pulling it out. So, then what we're looking for is that here is this this is the sample that um, 
was cut out with the, the core, with the inc increment borer. So it's, this is like this piece of wood that's been pulled out. So you can see the external bark and you can see all the way down to um, the center. So they measured it and they took, they wanted to go all the way into the center. So they got the full life history of the um, tree, but they didn't want to go all the way through in our terms of weakening the tree all the way through. And then, so this is blown up. And so then you can see um, kind of what's happening um, in terms of on the rings. The rings mean for every ring is a year of growth. Um, some trees, you can see some grew more some years and some years they grew less. So that might be because of um, what's going on in the, in that year. Then the dark colored is a summer or late wood and the light colored is the spring wood. Um, it's just how those are measured because that's when the tree is growing, it's dormant in the winter. So that's how you get some information from core sampling. Sorry. So by using the sampling method and studying the trees rings in the wood plug, people find out about tree ages. So the number of rings from the center, like I mentioned, Precipitation and growing seasons, so a wider ring, a wider space between the rings is means that it was a wetter season. They had more water and therefore um, more. The nutrients are available to the trees for growth. So again, not necessarily something that we can tell directly, but they're able to gather information from that core sample to figure out what nutrients have helped um, have been present so that the trees can grow. If there's been any sort of diseases or pests, that is going to become that's going to become apparent from their rings, um, from the core sample in terms of how that growth has happened and if the tree was fighting off something else instead of growing. So that's really interesting. Any events that might have happened and affected the tree growth, growth like drought or fire, um, if the tree has survived such an experience, then its rings will show you that that trauma, it'll come up in, in the rings, which is really cool. So core samples can also tell us foresters about how changes in climate have affected the health of trees. So that's also really interesting in terms of us being aware of the climate crisis and um, trying to make better choices. So then finally, the other thing that foresters uh, consider is becoming certified and sustainable. So forest and wood product management, sorry, man, sorry, let me say that again. Forest and wood products managed in sustainable ways are often certified by an international standard system, such as the International Forest Stewardship Council or the FSC. The FSC logo indicates to consumers that a wood product was produced using sustainable methods or came from a wood from a forest that was managed in a sustainable way. So this is really beneficial if you are choosing to make, if you wanna support sustainable businesses in order to put your money um, into sustainability, it might be more expensive um, because often sustainable practices are more time consuming and you need potentially different equipment. Um, and so instead of the earth paying part by experiencing pollution or things being not done in sustainable ways, we are paying more through our financial contribution. So it's a really cool logo to keep an eye out for. It's this one here with the sort of green check mark and tree. FSC again is the, uh, um, the certificate's name. So Canada currently is the world leader in FSC certification. Makes sense, we have a lot of the forest. So an FSC certified forest is one that is managed according to certain principles. So this is how partially how they decide that a forest can be FSC certified. So it must follow local and FSC laws. That makes sense. It also must be supporting indigenous people's rights. So if the indigenous people, the local indigenous groups of people are protesting something about how the forest is being managed, then you're not gonna be certified for that forest management. It need, you need to connect with the local indigenous population 
and make sure you are working with them in terms of how to work within the forest sustainably and still respect the land and the creatures. And you're minimizing environmental impact, which makes sense. If you want to be sust certified sustainable, then you need to make sure that you are actually sustainable. That there are monitoring and assessing operations. So you can't just be like, oh, right now we're good to go, but you need to have a plan in place about how you are going to continue to know that you're good to go and that the operation continues to be healthy and viable within uh, and sustainable within that um, forest. And you need to be planting trees. You need to, if you're going to be logging, you need to be replanting and rehabilitating that space. So that is also really important. So a sustainably managed forest also helps reduce carbon emissions. This is because forests contain a lot of carbon. We've talked about this before in terms of a carbon sink and a carbon source. Approximately 40 to 60% of the carbon in a tree is in the stump and the root system. And it remains in the soil after the tree is removed from the forest. A sustainably managed forest reduces the disturbance to forest soils that comes with tree harvesting. Narrow roads are built through the forest and new trees are planted quickly after mature trees are extracted. This helps keep as much carbon in forests as possible, even when trees are being harvested. So that's something to consider is that we can make choices that means that we are harming the environment less still by still extracting resources from the earth. So now you can do the check your understanding question on page 191. There's just the one question. All right, so now we've talked about fishing and um, forests. Now we're going to move on to looking at minerals. So there are many examples of economic gain and environmental degradation degradation, sorry, in Canada that are related to mining. So there are both positives and negatives. For one example, the effects of mining silver near Cobalt, Ontario in the early 1900s can still be seen today. So over a hundred years later. So lakes in the Cobalt area were drained to allow miners access to silver veins beneath the water. Huge piles of rocks and mining trailings remain where they were dumped. The remains of mines, old machinery, and buildings are scattered around the area. And cobalt still suffers, so the town still suffers from arsenic contamination. So that's pretty intense over 100 years ago, or 100 years later. The mining industry has changed since the early 1900s. However, despite stricter laws and diff different practices regarding viability of minerals and the environment, Extracting minerals continues to pollute the environment, affecting other natural resources like water, wildlife, and fisheries. So even though we are attempting to, to do better than we have done in the past, we still, as you can see in these two pictures, two examples of, of the impacts of mining on the environment, um, which is just frustrating. Okay, so what does the viability of minerals mean? So, Canada's mineral extractors try to make sure a potential mine is viable before they begin mining. They assess the value of the mineral deposit when they send out an exploration teams and make sure it will not be too expensive to remove the mineral from the ground. So this is just, is it worth to put the money in to get our money back in return? So it is an economical basis that this is judged on. Field geologists, geologists identify a potential mine by taking samples of the same size from different locations. Sampling minerals and metals can be difficult because one sample may have some sparsely distributed copper particles in it, for example, while another sample may have none. So because these are static rocks, it really can be a matter of if you're looking one foot to one direction or one foot to the other direction can make a completely world of difference. So sampling is really difficult because we don't necessarily get a full image just by taking a small part. The geologist's job is to determine if their samples contain a significant amount of the mineral they are searching for. If the samples are promising, the mining company will work for, they work for, will consider developing a mine. So now we need to look at environmental impact assessments. 
So Canada law attempt, so there are laws attempts to protect the environment from the many contaminants that are released during mining. Environmental impact assessments are completed before a mine is developed. These assessments are designed to ensure that the environment around the mine will not be severely harmed by mining activities. The potential mine will be responsible for complying with laws and for monitoring, monitoring air, land, and water quality around the mine. The wishes of local communities must also be taken into consideration before mining activities begin. So probably some folks in uh, communities in our area uh, have direct experience with this sort of things as there has recently been interest in mining in Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario. Um, so I'm sure many individuals have been part of conversations or have heard talk about the impacts that the new mines will have in Northwestern Ontario, both in terms of the economic gain and potential for work for people, but also how the, the impacts on the, on the environment and the land and the animals around as well. Um, so that's just something to consider. So next we're gonna talk about reclaiming mining areas. So mines can help bring jobs and other economic benefits to communities, like I just mentioned in terms of reflecting upon that in Northwestern Ontario. However, when mines are no longer viable, those same communities have to deal with job losses and environmental problems created by the mines. So we can think about um, because minerals are a non-renewable resource, this is once we mine all of something, there won't be anything else there. So we're putting all of this investment into extracting these minerals from the ground, building these mines, bringing up these equipment, people working, that once they are, there's no longer any minerals, then those jobs dry up. There's nothing left for those miners to do. And so if you move to an area to mine and then that mine closes, there's hard to know if there's going to be other work there. And as the, um, when we were talking about nuclear energy and um, they're potentially being putting a nuclear waste plant in Ignace, there was conversation there about how um, many folks, Ignace used to be a mining town, and since the mining has closed, um, there really hasn't been a lot of work, and that means that there's a lot of poverty and a lot of struggles in Ignace. So that's just one example of a local example of how the impact of um, job losses of one mining mine closes, and um, doesn't even dive into the uh, sorry the environmental issues of a mine. So mining companies are supposed to partner with government agencies to reclaim or clean up hazards, hazardous areas that surround former mines. Often, however, the damage done to an area cannot be completely cleaned up. So there can be intention, there can be uh, laws in place about expectations, protocols in place, but if um, there's no guarantee that these places are actually going to follow through as though, or if the, the damage hasn't been so severe that there's no hope. So orphan mines and the green mining initiative are one last thing to look at um, within relation to these mines. So in the past, there were no rules to govern how mines should operate and many were abandoned. They are called orphan mines. So these are incredibly dangerous spaces that are uh, just left there. So orphan tailings are the abandoned rock, water, and byproducts of mining that are usually close to orphan mines. They consist of heavy metals, fluid water, and other contaminants that can leach into groundwater and remain in the soil. So these are basically just uh, spots. In 2009, National Resource Canada introduced the Green Mining Initiative which will hopefully improve the mining industry's ability to minimize the waste it produces, recycle and reuse, waste coming from active mines and develop better ways to reclaim land from unused mines. I wasn't able to find any information about following up about how this has happened, like the, the state of this program in, since it opened in 20, sorry, 2009. So now you can do um, check out the questions on page 189, one and two. I think I put those in the wrong order. So I think, uh, the 
this slide should have been earlier, the earlier slide should have been later as I was going through it. I was like, that doesn't make sense. So glitch on my part. But anyway, at this point, you should do the check your understanding questions in that chapter. All right, and then finally, we're gonna talk about making difficult decisions. And we're gonna look at the oil sands specifically. So it's sometimes hard for people to make decisions about resources that ensure the environment is protected and preserved. I would say that's an understatement. I think it's a lot of the time it's hard for people to do that. For example, despite the negative impact, Budiman extraction and use has on the environment, Canada continues to mine and process the oil sands to export, for export and local use. Each glob of oil sands contains a core of sand, then water, then a casting of bitumen. The processes that separate these parts are, use huge amounts of water and natural gas. Much of the water used ends up in tailing ponds with other byproducts, so it is not reusable. The ecosystems affected by oil sands operations have been damaged. The extent of the damage done to the river and the groundwater are still not known. So stealing this water and then having it back in the land with other contaminants, we don't know what this means. And then also the lands in which the oil sands are located are not reclaimable. We can't recover um, and make these, so far we don't know a way to make these usable for the environment. So in addition to harming water and soil, oil sands operations are the largest source of new greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So we are damaging things, we are creating new emissions, why would we continue to do this? This just seems so obvious. So people around the world have criticized Canada and oil sands companies for continuing to mine the oil sands despite the damage it is causing. So we've been called out about why are we continuing to do this? But at the same time, the world continues to demand oil to run vehicles and airplanes and to manufacture items as diverse as hockey sticks, hair care products, and coffee tables. So we have not changed our practices. We're saying we shouldn't be using oil. We, should, we shouldn't be extracting this from the earth, which I agree, this isn't great, but we aren't giving ourselves anything else to do. So we can't, like, sure, if you're really wealthy, you can buy a electric car, but most of us can't do that. We don't have the funds to do that. And electric cars are not um, set to be affordable. They are still prestigious, expensive uh, commodities. And so if our governments and our were more invested in environmental health instead of capitalist health, then we would make it easier to stop um, extracting fossil fuels from our earth. So because traditional oil wells are harder and harder to find and more and more expensive to bring into production, the oil industry has placed its belts on the oil sands. I think it's, sorry, bets. Tell me it says bets, not belts. Oh, geez. To deliver oil to the people. So it's really like an oxymoron is that we're, they're saying, don't do this, but give us the results of what we don't want you to do. It doesn't work. So choosing sustainable development of non-renewable resources like minerals and petroleum products is difficult. It means that everyone must change their way of life. If we're going to stop driving cars with gasoline, that means we need to, our cars can't need gasoline to run anymore. We need to redesign them completely. If we're gonna stop extracting petroleum and making plastic, that means that if you look around your house right now or your room right now, how many things have plastic? Like I'm sitting in a room that has plastic um, containers. It has a desk that has plastic part on it. I have, I see a computer monitor and um, keyboard and shelving and a mouse and a phone and the chair that I'm sitting in has plastic on it. Um, my shoes probably have plastic in it. My clothes has, I have a zipper, so that has plastic on it. My water bottle is made out of plastic. My pencil doesn't have any plastic on it, but it's got rubber, so I don't know where that comes from. But in order for my pencil to be made, though it is not made out of plastic, it would have had to have been transported by something at some point, at probably multiple points, in order to be created. 
we're just so reliable on plastic and gas or petroleum to create so much of our things that it's like it's a complete uh complete societal change so it's estimated that canadians each canadian uses about 25 barrels of oil every year as opposed to an average person in other developed nations we use about 12 barrels a year so we would use twice it's saying that we use twice the amount of oil and to make our products and to use our um, gas, like things like that, transportation, than other places. Again, that isn't something that is easy to to just stop doing. It isn't uh, like we need to get to work. We live in an area that is vast. Canada, things are really far apart in Canada. There's, it's not reasonable to have public transportation, which means that we individually have to get to work, get to school, get to our lives, go through shop um by using vehicles by using gasoline um it just but other places in the world can do it and so there i believe that we can do it we just need a complete shift like why did they rip up all of the railway tracks maybe it would have made more sense to invest in a better railway system that was actually accessible and affordable and made sense maybe it would have made sense to put in more railway tracks and then be less dependent upon airplanes and cars and buses for driving. Anyway, just one suggestion. Too late though. Of course, we must cut down. At the same time, until alternative power cars and other products are available to people, petroleum will continue to be in demand. That's what I've just written about. In the end, the choice not to use a resource and to develop and support a sustainable replacement for the resource will eventually become necessary in order to maintain the other important natural resource that Canada has, water, wildlife, fisheries, and forests. So really we're gonna to get to the point where we have no other option. I, I don't know when that point's gonna be. I think we're getting pretty close um, with the climate crisis, but I don't know if enough is being done. And that is a wrap of our new information. So we are finished lesson 23 which means that we're finished chapter seven, which means that we are finished our course in terms of new information. So review of what we talked about today in managing Canada's natural resources. So first we talked about fish and forests and so how to monitor their health and how to maintain them sustainably. Then we talked about mining minerals and how the viability works and how we, that is measured um, and how to clean up and reclaim mines is really difficult and has lifelong generation to generation impacts. And then we talked about oil sands and how they are have extensive pollution, but that we are dependent upon them. And until we develop affordable alternatives, we don't really have other options. And so how are we gonna manage that? So hopefully you can explain how to monitor maintain fisheries and forests you can explain concerns surrounding mining minerals, both the viability and the recovery, and you can explain the problems with the oil sands. This is another lesson where we have an activity to do on page 192. So you are looking at this to, you're gonna, sorry, I don't know why I'm writing on the screen. That was an accident. Um, so you're going to consider these four statements and think about who they might represent, who they might be talking about if you are proposing to develop an oil sands near an imaginary town. So you have four people who are stakeholders in the in the town and write down questions that you would ask the stakeholders to understand their positions. Then here, share your questions with the other class, others in your class, you can't do that. Um, but see if you maybe share some some with someone in your life. Share the question with someone in your life and see if you can make an improvement to one of your questions. And then reflect upon that process. And then you can do the review questions on page 193, uh, questions 1 through 14. All right, so that is a wrap on all of our new information. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and connect with me. I am connecting with students, but definitely it's if you connect with me, I will respond very, very quickly. Whereas if you wait for me to connect with you, it might take a while. 
You can call me at 807-737-1488 and my extension is 2209. You can also call us toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My email address is bronwyn.slate and that is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can connect with me through Facebook at B Slate Wassa. And you can find me on YouTube at B Slate Wassa, where our, all of our lessons are uploaded and you can watch them there. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So feel free to reach out for to me during that time. Um, I'm happy to talk talk science and talk these things. Remember, you need to have your culminating assignments do, done as well on June 10th, as well as all of your coursework. So please send me your work and reach out if you are hoping to get your credit this term. Thank you so much for joining me. Bewitch.